Well, it's, um, it's great to be with you this evening. Um, and I guess I've got this question, why do I need God? And since you've just won the rugby, I'm guessing many of you are thinking, no, we don't. Um, and so, um, and they should have let you know that they actually put the end of the match up on the big screen in here. So the few of you who were here, there was a large cheer went up. Uh, so I take it that actually we have no Welsh visitors amongst us because uh, no one was crying. But um, the plan is I'm going to try and, as I say, see if I can make some sense of, of this question. Um, when you've got an area as big as this, to try to cover all the bases up front is, is, is impossible. So I'm hoping it will just leave enough room for question for you to come back to me, ask me questions and, or challenge or make statements. I'll try and do my best to respond to them. Now, obviously, the way the question's been structured, the way it's been given to me, why do I need God, is, is actually quite, is quite specific. It's not saying, is there one? But even if there is, why would I need one? Because many people do conclude that there is a God but are very happy to think, actually, I think I'll try and live without him. Thank you very much. Um, one of the most uh, famous um, professors, uh, philosophy, uh, um, professors of atheism who were a philosopher for the last um, 30, 40 years was a guy by the name of Anthony Flew, who produced the most widely reprinted um, philosophical article um, called uh, Theology and Falsification of the 20th Century, uh, which actually came out of, he had a debate, a debate with C.S. Lewis at Oxford University uh, where they were contemporaries together and many people felt that this guy Anthony Flew had actually won, come out on top of that debate. And then he reworked that material into this particular, particular philosophy article. I say it was reprinted in all kinds of journals all across the world. And um, for many, many years, if you went to the Secular Society's website or the Humanist Society's website, you would find that his book, An Introduction to Philosophy, was the basic philosophical tech book, textbook recommended if you wanted to be, you know, recommended reading for atheists. Now, um, his, that recommendation was pulled several years ago when Anthony Flew came out rather publicly announcing that he thought maybe there was a God after all. Um, and uh, then went on to write another book entitled There Is... Well, actually, printed... The printed title, There Is No God, but the way they printed it was it said There Is No God, and then the word no had been scratched out with a red pen and the letter A written above that. So it just simply said There Is A God. And it simply tells his story of how he moved from being an absolutely convinced atheist and actually indeed someone who had provided a lot of the arguments which you hear today against God. He had either helped pioneer or helped refine or helped phrase in a way to make them accessible to people. Um, and how he'd moved from that to actually concluding now that actually there was a God after all. One of the stories he tells was how um, he did a whole series of debates which sort of shifted him slowly over the, the course of um, a couple of decades and if you get the book and read it, it's not a very technical book. It's just simply his story. Um, you have to go to all the footnotes and read all the stuff in the footnotes if you actually want to be taken much, much further through. Um, but one of the stories he tells was how back in the 80s he was involved in a debate. And um, one of the um, things that he helped popularize, um, Anthony Flew, was he used to say, look, if you give enough monkeys typewriters, eventually they'll produce the works of Shakespeare. He said, so, you know, when we talk about, hey, look, maybe we need to find a god or have a god to explain all the complexities in life, that's really not that necessary. And uh, he was involved in a debate with someone, and this person who he was debating with said, do you know, he says, that the British Arts Council have actually paid for a piece of research to done where they put a computer and a keyboard in a cage with six monkeys and left it there for a while to see what would happen. And apart from using it as a toilet, um, they also produced uh, 50 typed pages uh, between them. Um, but interestingly, not one single word, which is all the more interesting when you consider that the shortest word in the English language is either the letter A or I. Um, but a word isn't a word unless it has a space either side of it. So if you have a basic keyboard of 26 letters and a few other keys, so let's suppose there are 30 altogether, the randomness of producing a single word by chance, he said, would be 1 by times 30 to 30 to 30, or 1 in 27,000. So the guy then said, well, look, what would be the chance, for example, of randomly generating a Shakespearean sonnet? Now, all Shakespearean sonnets are, by definition, 14 lines long. So he picked one, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? There are 488 letters in it. What's the chance of just randomly generating 488 letters in the right sequence? Well, the answer is 1 times 10 to the power of 690. In other words, if you imagine 10 with 690 zeros after it and you put a 1 on the top, 1 divided by, that's the chance of doing it by random. That's quite a small number. To give you some idea, the total number of known particles in the universe, and we're not talking about grains of sand, we're talking about protons, neutrons, and electrons, is about 10 to the power of 80 particles in the universe. So that's 10 with 80 zeros after it which basically means there aren't enough particles in the universe to write down the trials, let alone do it. Anthony Flew then said that as he began to realize this, it was then pointed out to him, he said, let's supposing, however, he says, you took all the known matter in the universe and you converted it into microchips. Each microchip 
weighing a millionth of a gram, and each microchip is capable of producing random combinations of 488 letters one million times a second, and so assuming, he said, that those computers have been running since the beginning of time, he says the number of different combinations they would have produced would have been 1 times 10 to the power of 90, which means you're still 10 to the power of 600 short, 10 with 600 zeros after it, the number too small to have done it. And then he says, and well, this was just one of the things that, as he began to think about it, he began to think, well, maybe some of the traditional lines that he's, I have pioneered and used are not as tightly formed as I had thought there was. But he has now come to a position where he believes that maybe there is a God, but he's not necessarily convinced that he needs God. And so when you ask the question, why do I need God, it is a slightly different question to saying, is, is there one? It's assuming that even if there is, maybe he's not necessary. And so it's, and there are so many different ways of, of, of handling and approaching this, as I say, and it's a bit difficult at times to know exactly what would be the best way of doing it. Now, when you also talk about why do I need something, it also assumes that you actually know what you need. And as someone has said, we actually live in a very highly educated yet emotionally illiterate culture. And we're not always sure exactly what we need, and sometimes what we think we need when we get, we actually realize that we didn't need it. Um, men and gadgets, for example, normally illustrate this point very, very well. And of course, we also now live in a time where a lot of people feel, especially when they see the amount of war and violence that may be committed in the name of religion and when it comes to God, would actually say, actually, the whole society as a whole would be much better off without it, thank you very much. So it's not even just simply the fact that maybe this is right or wrong, it's not even that, it's just, look, this is not a good idea and we need to get away from it. And obviously, many of you here would have been involved, you know, through your, um, during your, the course of you living here, have actually seen the, the, the disastrous outworking of that. And I'd just like to start off by saying that if your experience of Christianity has been overwhelmingly negative, then first of all, I would just like to say just a couple of things to that. A few years ago, I was asked to give a talk um, in, a, in a particular setting, and they said, we want, the title we want you to speak to, because I don't come up with my own titles, because I'm just too lazy to do that. I ask other people to give me the titles or the questions. They said, the title we want you to speak to is, has the Christian faith failed you? And we'll advertise it, and people will come. And I wrote back, and I said, this isn't really the kind of thing I do. Um, you know, I'll give a talk on more like, why should you be a Christian? And they said, no, 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 we want you to talk on has the Christian faith failed you? We think that a lot of people will come. Okay? And we think this will resonate with a lot of people. And I said, uh, first of all, I'm not sure it will resonate. And secondly, uh, you know, it seems awfully negative. I don't know if I really want to do it. Anyway, the venue they used was a big theater that would seat 5,000 people. And they had to issue tickets. No, and the tickets were free. They weren't being sold. It was just to make sure there were 5,000 seats and health and safety and all this kind of stuff. You know, they had, everyone had to have a ticket so they knew how many people were coming. The organizers said, actually, we have thought about not bothering issuing tickets in your case because so few people are going to come to this event. But, you know, we have to issue the tickets as well. So, you know. Anyway, every single ticket disappeared. And then some people who'd taken free tickets and then couldn't come to the event started auctioning them off on eBay. And then people started complaining that we were trying to make money out of this event and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, that wasn't fair. And, we had to point out it wasn't us who was doing it. It was these people who had these tickets. Quite clever people, obviously. And um, it was interesting simply to see the level of interest in that particular question. Because for a lot of people, they felt that it has failed. And for a lot of people, the reason why they felt it had failed was simply be because of the Christians and the Christianity which they'd seen. And it had put them off incredibly. Now, interestingly, right from the very word go, right from the beginning of the Christian faith and ever since Jesus Christ came and walked on this planet and the church was set up, one of the big battles the church has always had and Christians have always had is to say, look, what is a real Christian and what isn't? What is true Christianity? What simply looks like Christianity but is false? What does it truly mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be pretending to be a Christian? And one of the very first pieces of literature ever written by a Christian to a group of people in a part of the world called Galatia one of the very first Christians, a guy called the Apostle Paul, he wrote to them and he was very concerned and he said, look, don't be fooled by people who are claiming to be Christians but aren't. He says, if you meet someone who says they are a Christian, there should be a fruit in their life, okay, a single fruit, and it should taste of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, and so on. He says, that's what it should taste like. He said, if you meet someone who claims they are a Christian and you taste their life, then what you should taste should be that. He said, if, however, what you taste isn't that, and said you meet murder, lust, envy, strife, and all of those things, not only do you have the right to question whether they are a Christian, you have every right to challenge them and say, wait a minute. Where is the reality of this in your life? It seems to be wholly and totally absent. So the first thing I'd like to say is for those of you who have met, and your encounter of Christianity has been one that's been very negative, um, I would, first of all, I would love to apologize for that. 
But I find it interesting that even within the Bible itself, there are some very strong words which are said about what does it mean if someone goes around claiming they are a Christian? What should their life look like? What is the reality of what should actually be there? And then encouraging people to look for that reality and pursue it and go after it. Now, I know that we live in a very, very cynical age. It's been interesting. A whole bunch of psychological studies have been done recently that link especially TV watching with cynicism. Um, and in media-driven cultures, we seem to become increasingly cynical. As a matter of fact, for quite a long time ago, back in 1977, the Detroit Free Press in North America did an experiment where they asked for families to give up watching television for one month, and they would give them $500 and then monitor them psychologically to see how they coped. They had to ring up 200 families before they found five that were willing to give up TV for a month to get $500. $500 for me is a lot of money today. $500 30 years ago was, was a serious amount of money. The families that agreed were then monitored. It was very interesting. The, t- the families that gave up TV suffered classical withdrawal symptoms. The amount of violence increased. The use of tranquilizers, drugs, and smoking went up dramatically within those families. One woman reported to the psycho- clinical psychologist reporting on this, and I quote, it was terrible. We did nothing. My husband and I talked. <laughs> and so <laughs> we are in um, a very, very interesting culture, and I, and I realized that that is the case. And I hope this evening, for those of you who are either feeling cynical or skeptical or unsure, will at least provide the opportunity to raise some issues and some questions and then for me to try and do my best to try and answer them. Now, what what I want to try and do um, in terms of framing my remarks is I'd actually like to borrow an outline from a different speaker, from a guy, um, a classical Greek guy called Aristotle, who wrote a book called The Politics. Oh, Oh, he wrote a book called, he wrote a book called The Rhetoric, sorry. And in his book, The Rhetoric, he put some of his comments about when, about to do with the use of rhetoric and listening to speeches under three main headings. And I'd like to take those headings and use them in a slightly different way for the purposes of what I want to say today. But he talked about ethos, pathos, logos, ethos, pathos, logos, if you like. And what I'd like to do is try to phrase my remarks on why do we need God under those three general, general headings. Now, I'm going to also make uh, a, a very dangerous assumption, which is this. It's abs- and because of the comments I made about we're not talking about whether there is a God necessarily, although I'm happy to go back to that, but whether we need God, I'm going to talk slightly more on the what do we need side. Now, the danger with doing that, and I, I realize there is a very big danger, is then you can say, well, yes, but this is just simply a psychological crutch. And as I travel around the world, an awful lot of people sometimes say something like this to me. Look, Michael, we're very happy that you're a Christian, and you, know, you seem to be very happy that you're a Christian, and that's great. And I wish I could believe what you believe, but I can't. Now, I'm the kind of guy, when I hear something said to me in more than one different culture by more than one different people, I like to go away and think about it. And I thought, why do people say this? And what they're basically saying is this, look, Michael, you seem to be very happy as a, as a person, and that's great. I'm happy that you're happy. As a matter of fact, the kind of happiness and joy and fulfillment you have in life, I actually find attractive. But the reason you seem to have this happiness and joy is because you are a Christian. It's because you believe in Jesus. In other words, you believe in something that isn't there. Now, what do you call people that believe in things that don't exist? And the answer is mad people. So what they're actually saying is, Michael, you are insane. But the main thing is, is that you are happy and insane. (laughs) I am happy that you are happy. As a matter of fact, I'm so desperate to know this kind of joy that you talk about. I, too, would embrace insanity just to join you. And I've thought about it, but I just can't. (laughs) Now... That is a misunderstanding of the nature of the term faith as it is used, certainly within within, uh, uh, biblical writing. In today's culture, the idea of faith is, faith is what you have when you want to believe something, but you don't know whether it's true or not. Does that make sense? So it would be nice if it were true, and you can sort of get fairly close, but you really can't get there. And so you close your eyes, and you take a huge leap of faith, and then all of a sudden you can believe. So faith, therefore, is believing in something which you think or you would like to be true, but you're not sure is. Strong faith, therefore, is believing in something that you suspect isn't true, and yet you're still able to believe it, because obviously it requires a bit more conviction. And the strongest possible kind of faith you would have